Good morning and happy Sabbath to all of you. I'd like to thank your pastor as well as all of you for giving me the opportunity to share the Word of God with you today, to open the Scriptures and God willing to open our hearts to what God has to share with us. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, today we thank you that on this day we can not only gather to worship you according to your commandment, but that we can do so in freedom that we yet enjoy in this country. We ask, Lord, that as we take time to open the scriptures, that you may open our hearts as you did with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, that our hearts may burn within us as you speak to us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the director for the Texas Conference in the area of public affairs and religious liberty, it's my opportunity to share with you today a passage of Scripture dealing with not only our identity as Seventh-day Adventists, but also with a very central part of the message and the work that God has called us to do in the area of religious freedom and freedom of conscience. To begin, I'd like to ask if our deacons that have the uh, bulletin, or, or excuse me, a little newsletter handout, if they would hand that out at this time, uh, one per family. And this gives you a little bit of a brief description of the work that we do at the conference level. And it also has information, uh, contact information if you desire to get in touch with me uh, and you have need of a Sabbath issue either at work or in your education. Uh, you can certainly get in touch with me and I will be glad to assist you with that. I would like to mention that I started in this position from January of 2013 uh, to the present time, so a little over three years that I've been doing this work. And I always take the time to give God the glory because during this time of a little over three years, with God's grace, we've been able to help uh, approximately 60 Seventh-day Adventist in the Texas conference that have either had conflict uh, regarding the Sabbath observance at their work or in their educational pursuits. And out of those 60 individuals, we have had an approximately 55 of those that have been resolved successfully, meaning that those individuals have retained their work and they've also retained their faith and have kept the Sabbath. So with that kind of a track record, uh, you're looking at about 94, 95, 96 percent track record, and that's something that only God can do. Uh, we as human beings certainly cannot do that on our own. And in one particular case I can share with you, uh, I was giving Bible studies to an individual there in Waco, and he and his wife were very enthusiastic uh, in love with Christ and embracing our message. And the only thing that the gentleman, he shared with me, he said, you know, Pastor Cook, he said the challenge that, he said, these are wonderful truths. I see the truth clearly from Scripture, but the challenge that I can foresee right now is being able to have the Sabbath free every week. And as he shared with me, uh, he was actually serving in a supervisory position at a plant there in Waco. And I, pr I told him, I said, well, Number one, do you have faith in God? He said, yes. I said, number two, do you believe the truths that you've learned regarding the Sabbath and the importance of keeping that day? He said, yes. I said, well, everything is solved then. I said, let's pray about it. And we did. And he actually took the initiative because I, I told him I could write a letter for him, but he took the initiative to talk with his immediate uh, supervisor about it. And within about two days, they got back in touch with him and they told him, we recognize that the position that you have is a supervisory position and normally people in that kind of position, they need to come in at least two Sabbaths per month to oversee the people in their department. So as we considered your request and we also considered the great needs that we have in our company, what we have decided to do to avoid this kind of a potential conflict is actually promote you to a higher position that doesn't require you to come in on any Sabbath and it gives you a higher pay scale and more benefits. And God did that. I didn't even have to write a letter. Uh, so God is in the business of helping Seventh-day Adventists that desire to be faithful to Him and honor Him because He's told us that if we will honor Him, He will honor us. Amen? Amen. The other thing that I did want to take a brief moment to share with you, if we can have on the screen uh, displayed, there we go, um, there is a website you can look at. It's libertymagazine.org. 
And on the front main page, if you click on the author archive, uh, they will take you to a second page and there's a whole list of na the names of authors that have submitted articles to Liberty Magazine over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And if you look under my name, Edwin Cook, um, there's actually two that are listed, one that is Edwin Cook and one that's Edwin C. Cook. Both of those refer to me. Uh, I don't know why they put listed it at two different uh, names that way. But if you click on either of those, there are a number of articles that I have published in Liberty Magazine during the last 11 or 12 years. And uh, there is one, the most recent one, that was published in, I think it was January, February of this year, or maybe November, December of last year, talking about the Pope's visit to America and when he addressed uh, the Congress in the fall of last year. Uh, so that's something that you can look up on the internet. Those are free. doesn't cost you anything. And part of what I also do in my seminars is promote the Liberty Offering, offering Campaign. Uh, that is, it starts in January and it runs roughly through, technically through the end of this month. So if you haven't given already or if you would like to give in addition to what you have given, we would like to encourage you to do that. Uh, Liberty Magazine is a magazine that reaches it uh, has a circulation base of about 200,000. Um, that we have a lot of faithful members like yourselves that support the publication of that magazine and the sending of it to different constitutional scholars, to professors, to attorneys, uh, congressmen at all levels from the local le uh, state level all the way up to the national level. And they are informed on issues of religious freedom. And that is something that for many years, over 100 years, Liberty Magazine has done a wonderful work in uh, promoting the, the concepts that we believe in of religious freedom and freedom of conscience. The other thing that I briefly wanted to share with you, uh, I have a copy of my book uh, that is dealing with Roman Catholicism and religious freedom. If you're interested in getting a copy of that, you can go to Amazon and look up the title. This afternoon in my seminar starting at 3 o'clock, I will be talking about this uh, items that I've discussed in this book and dealing with the topic of modern Roman Catholicism and religious freedom and what does that mean to us as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, I would simply like to make two comments regarding that and then I'll leave the rest of my comments for this afternoon. But again, alluding to the article that I wrote regarding the Pope's visit in the fall of last year and how he addressed the Congress, that was the first time in the history of America when a Pope has ever spoken to a joint session of Congress. And uh, hardly anyone in the media called out attention to the fact of the violation of church and state, separation of church and state. And so my article is dealing with that. But that is something that uh, one, one can look at that and say those are signs of the times where we see that there is a gradual shifting in our concept in America regarding our ideas of church and state separation and as well as freedom of conscience. The other thing that I would like to also again draw our attention to on this topic is that just uh, about three weeks ago among the the Republican candidates in their debates for the presidential candidacy one of the topics a hot topic that is on the agenda is dealing with immigration. Now, I'm not going into politics um, okay, in the sermon, but I'm simply mentioning that in the light of that, the Pope, Pope Francis I, made a comment regarding that and actually met on the Mexican side of the border in El Paso and began to promote the idea and the concept of immigrants and refugees, their rights as human beings, in light of the stance that Trump and a few other Republican candidates have taken on the issue of immigration and the building of a wall between our country and Mexico. And again, I'm not stating either in favor or against. The point that I'm emphasizing, though, is that you have not only politicians addressing the issue, but now you have a high-level uh, religious leader of a very large religious uh, denomination worldwide that was weighing in on it. And there was some comments and exchanges going on back and forth. So again, those are things that help us to perceive a little bit more clearly the times that we're living in as well as certain fundamental teachings that we believe in as Seventh-day Adventists that come into sharp focus uh, during these things that are now taking place. And in essence, it shows us that there is a gradual moving ahead in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Uh, so this afternoon, I'll be uh, speaking more on this topic of modern Roman Catholicism and religious freedom and what does that mean to us as Seventh-day Adventists. 
Uh, for this morning, I would like to take time, if you would open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 14. And the topic that we're looking at today in Revelation 14, verse 6, is dealing with the three angels' messages and religious freedom. And to give you just a brief background on uh, my background a little bit before we go into the sermon, I obviously am an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. I've been uh, working for the Lord's Church for a little over 20 years. And back in 2012, I graduated from Baylor University with my Ph.D. in Church and State Studies. Uh, but I always tell people don't refer to me as Dr. Pastor Cook because they might not know which of the three I am, right? <laughs> Although I do tell people that I was born a cook if they ask me about my culinary skills. Um, but focusing on this aspect... Uh, 2012, I spent, I graduated from Baylor and I'd spent six years there uh, working on my doctoral degree. The last two years uh, were focusing on my dissertation. One of those years I spent traveling to Spain and Mexico and doing research and gathering all the information. And then I spent one year writing the dissertation. Uh, but basically, my time at Baylor was something where God blessed me. Uh, I had an opportunity to interact with Baptists as well as some Catholic students that were there, some Methodists, and across the board from different Christian den denominations. And that's one of the things that I would like to uh, just mention in recognition of Baylor. Uh, Baylor has a history throughout their history as a denomination where they line up with our views as well on the idea of separation of church and state and freedom of conscience. And actually that was the reason why I, I felt the Lord was leading me there and I chose to go there to get my doctoral degree in church and state studies. Not only are they the only university in the world that offered a degree, a PhD in church and state, not even Andrews University offers that degree, uh, but also they have that long history of promoting and championing freedom of conscience for not only Baptists, but for other individuals of different faith groups. So I, I was very comfortable as far as interacting with the professors there as well as the faculty. And I had some very interesting conversations whenever I would meet Baptists and we started conversing together, comparing notes on our spiritual journey and so forth. Uh, I would share with them that as a Seventh-day Adventist, that Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists are actually cousins. And they would meet me with kind of a little question on their face, a look wondering what I was referring to. And I told them that it was actually Seventh Day, a Seventh Day Baptist that shared with Seventh Day Adventists who were Sunday keepers at the time about the Seventh Day Sabbath. And uh, that is something that many Baptists nowadays uh, are not aware of, their history that goes back over 100 years ago when there were more Seventh Day Baptists in America than there are today. And so once we start on kind of that conversation, then I share with them that not only Baptists, but Seventh Day Adventists, we believe in baptism by immersion, we believe in the authority of Scripture etc. and so forth. And so I had some fruitful conversations uh, there at Baylor uh, during the, the years that I was there. But in addition to that, the thing that I, I always remember is that the, the regents at Baylor were very respectful of my conscientious convictions because when it came time for my graduation, they posted on their website, usually about uh, three to four months in advance. So this was in the summertime around June. I started looking at, uh, actually back in uh, May, May and, uh, May and June, I started looking at the website to find out what dates the graduation would fall on. And they, ha they always have, historically at Baylor University, they've always had a special graduation service on Friday that is held in their chapel at the seminary. And that is only for those students that are masters or doctoral students in ministry. In other words, they're Baptist ministers that are going to be uh, specially recognized and ordained and sent out into the mission field to pro preach and proclaim the gospel. The rest of the graduates, all of the other graduates, all of the other schools at Baylor, they graduate on Saturday. Well, I checked, in checking the calendar, I recognized it with my school. Sure enough, they had the graduation service planned for Saturday. Well, in advance, I sent an email to the, the uh, rector and also to the president of Baylor explaining my situation, that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. I had family coming in from other states that would be there to celebrate with me. And I, I simply said, you know, 
I've taken time. I'm earning my PhD in church and state studies. I respect and understand that Baptists have a long history of respecting freedom of conscience of others and that in our International Religious Liberty Association, which was founded by Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, and I mentioned this in the email, that we have actually had Baptists who have served as presidents of the IRLA, the International Religious Liberty Association. And so anyway, I shared with them and asked them if they would consider uh, making an exception and accommodating me so that I could go ahead and graduate uh, but not on Saturday. After I sent the email, uh, three, four weeks went by. We were getting close, closer to graduation date and I got an email back and they told me that uh, they were going to go ahead the first time in the history of Baylor as a, a university more than a hundred years in existence. They were going to make an accommodation and they allowed me to graduate with the group on Friday. Now, that wasn't all, though. When I got there on Friday for the graduation service, I was the only one uh, in my, my uh, tunic that was very distinct and different from the other graduates because they had more of a red color indicating seminary graduates and going out as ministers of the Baptist faith. Mine was pure green, the Baylor colors, with a different hood. Um, and so as I, was, as I marched in with all of the graduates and we took our, our place there in the front of the chapel, the rector ended up calling the attention of the whole chapel that was filled with people there and he said I would imagine that all of you have noticed that in the group of the graduates that have come down to the front are candidates that are here that there is one that is different uh, in a different color of a robe than all of the rest he said this gentleman is a Seventh-day Adventist and then he went in and he explained to them what had happened with my convictions and the email that I sent to them. And so he, he said that uh, we as, as a, ba a Baptist and as Baylor University, in the first time in the history of our university, we've taken time to make this accommodation for his religious convictions. And in front of the whole group, uh, he recognized me. And, and of course, I shouted out a large thank you. Uh, at that point. Um, so the point that I mentioned is that I always like to share this story because those of us in, our, in the audience, those of you that are students pursuing your education either at the college level or even at the high school level, God has always told us and he will always maintain the principle in his word that if we will honor him, he will honor us. Um, another little thing that I went through six years of my graduate studies there at Baylor, my colleagues that were pursuing their degrees as well, they typically would work basically 24-7, seven, seven days out of the week, uh, even though they were Christians going to church on Sunday in the morning, but they would go ahead and use the rest of their, their Sabbath on Sunday uh, using that time to study. And I never, never did take time at any point in my educational history from the time that I went through, became a Seventh-day Adventist, went through college, got my master's degree, and then got my doctoral degree. At no time did I ever, have I ever done studies on the Sabbath day. And it's a firm conviction that I've had that that is God's time, and I don't use that time to do my schoolwork. I do that during the time outside of the Sabbath. And because I did that, the interesting thing uh, is that whenever we had exams at the doctoral level, and those were exams where basically they would, there was nothing that was multiple choice, by the way. Uh, at the doctoral level, everything is essay. They give you three questions and three to four hours, and you sit there and you write. Um, and so based on that, my colleagues would take the time, spend the night, the whole night before staying up studying and using time throughout the week studying. Uh, but I would always take the Sabbath and would feel refreshed afterwards. And uh, then when we would get to exam time, several of them would be falling asleep and not able to complete the exam. And uh, God would bless me with clarity and, and I did, uh, did well in my studies there. So I take time to recognize what God has done and uh, to praise Him for that and thank Him for it as well as to encourage others in the audience, uh, whether in here personally seated or in the viewing audience that might be pursuing your education. Honor God and He will honor you. Amen. Amen. Revelation 14 verse 6. John wrote, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And with that prophetic statement, that is how God began a movement. Notice that I did not say a church. God began a movement, a prophetic movement that nowadays we are recognized as Seventh-day Adventists. Having 18, between 18 and 20 million members worldwide, 
having the largest among Protestants, the largest educational system in the world, and also the largest number of clinics and hospitals uh, around the world. And that's something that uh, we can praise God for what he's done. Amen? Amen? We also have entered among the nations that are officially recognized by the United Nations. We have entered into all but five of those at the current time. So we have individuals that have been motivated and moved by the Holy Spirit that have captured the vision that God gave to our early founders, our pioneers, about taking the three angels' messages to the world. And specifically in this verse, the first thing that we focus on when it's talking about in Revelation 14, verse 6, about taking this message to all of Earth's inhabitants is focusing on the missiology. Uh, missiology meaning the mission focus. And at the very beginning of our work, it is true that many of our, in fact, is all of our pioneers, in the beginning, believed that if they took the three angels' messages to the people in America, that they had fulfilled the work that God called them to do. Until they took time to go back and study the scriptures based on counsel that our pioneers and that Ellen White gave to them, talking about a vision where she saw the earth as a globe that was slowly spinning and there were points of light all across the surface of the globe. And she said that is the work that God has given us to do in taking this message to all of Earth's inhabitants. And when we understand the solemnity of the three angels' messages, it is a message in which in reality it is a divine message. It's God's response to Satan's activity of deceit upon the earth. And in broad pin strokes, if we take time to study Revelation chapters 12, 13, and 14. Chapter 12 introduces us to not only the warfare that began in heaven in chapter 12, verses 7 and 9, talking about the conflict between Michael and Lucifer who became the devil and was cast out of heaven, but it also talks about how the devil on this earth works through certain agencies, and that's described in, in chapter 12 of Revelation, where you find that the woman is pursued by the dragon, the dragon seeks to devour her and her offspring in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It talks about that. That is the prelude to chapter 13 that goes into zeros in on, on the focus, dealing with two specific agencies, the beast that comes up out of the, earth, out of the sea and the beast that comes up out of the earth. Now, in Adventist uh, understanding of, of history and, and Bible prophecy, we understand those referring to a religious political power is the power that comes up out of the sea, and the other one being a political power coming up out of the earth that converts, it metamorphoses into a religious and political power. And both of those entities, under the guidance and the, the power, the impulse of Satan, unite to form a threefold false trinity in the end of time to deceive earth's inhabitants and in essence to enforce of what the Bible talks about there in Revelation chapter 13 verses 15 through 17, the mark of the beast. Now in response to that, we find in Revelation chapter 14 verses 1 through 5 talk about the 144,000, the special elect group, God's chosen people that will represent his character and uphold his law. And verses 6 through 12 of chapter 14 talk about the specific message that God has given to his movement, his people, to preach and proclaim in the end of time. And that message is known as the three angels' messages. It is the last message of mercy that God is giving to earth's inhabitants. And for that reason, it is weighted with solemnity. And for that reason, the movement that God himself spoke into existence based on Revelation 14, verse 6, where God says that he saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the message, the everlasting gospel, to preach to those that dwell upon the earth. And then from there he goes into the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. And continually from the first to the third, there's a growing weight of solemnity and warning until we get to the third angel's message where God warns earth's inhabitants not to worship the beast or his number or to receive the mark uh, that the, the beast is in essence enforcing. And that is upon pain of in essence eternal destruction. I don't say eternal torment, but eternal destruction. Now, with that broad background, when we as Seventh-day Adventists understand our identity, why God has given us that, this message, it was not to simply produce 
another denomination among a variety of 200, 300 plus denominations that are now in existence. It was not for the sake of gathering a group of people that just believed something different than other Christian groups believed. It was not to gather a group of people together just to oppose and speak against Catholicism. But instead it was a group of people that God called out of the world to understand who He is as God, as a loving God, a merciful God, but also a God of justice, a God who will uphold His law. And that balance is what we find that is the essence of the three angels' messages. The mission work that God has given us to do, those Seventh-day Adventists that receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that are truly converted, the first thing that they do, the first impulse that we should have is to share Christ and the message of the three angels with others. Now, some of us may feel that we are shy and we can't give Bible studies, we can't stand up front and preach a sermon, but we certainly can pray for our neighbors and we can pray for those that are going out to do the work that God has given us to do. Amen? We also can find little ways of sharing our faith. Handing out a piece of literature to somebody or making a, baking a loaf of bread and taking it to my neighbor. Uh, doing what we would call Christian service activities that can help soften individuals to be open and receptive to receiving the three angels' messages. Now, what I would like to state at this point, dealing with the mission and the work that God has given us to do. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a variety of, if I could use the term, a variety of Adventists within Adventism. There are some Seventh-day Adventists in the world that are facing persecution and that have embraced this message to the point that they're willing to lay down their life and go through any sacrifice to stand for Christ and to preach this message in spite of all of the obstacles. There are other Seventh-day Adventists that would shy from that and perhaps would even, maybe we could say, reach the point of being nominal in their faith and not really connected to Christ and have no motivation to share Christ in some way with others. The difference between both groups and I know this is a strong statement that I'm about to make. But the difference is those that receive the Holy Spirit and that are born again are born into God's kingdom as missionaries. If we don't have some kind of a desire and an impulse to share our faith in some small fashion or some large way as God has gifted us, then we need to take time to question whether we have actually been converted. Now, I know that's a strong statement, but we need to take time to do self-examination and actually ask ourselves, am I in the faith? Have I connected with Christ? Have I received the Holy Spirit? Or am I a Seventh-day Adventist, as one would say, in name only? That I come to church sometimes as it's convenient for me or maybe regularly every Sabbath if I don't have conflicts with Sabbath at work, but that's the extent of my faith as a Seventh-day Adventist. The challenge that we face in the American context, it is true that there are some areas of America where I would agree that they are what we might call burnt over. Uh, people that they say we've heard so much of the gospel from any denomination that we just close our doors. There are some places that would say and actually identify us as Seventh-day Adventists with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons and when they see us knocking at the door, they don't bother to open the door. That is true, even though we are not at all associated uh, in beliefs as those two denominations. Uh, we believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, the, the divine Son of God, which is distinct and different from uh, some of the beliefs of those, those other two groups I mentioned. So that is true, but at the same time, that does not remove from us our God-given obligation and responsibility in answering, answering God's call to say at least we took the message to their door, even if they don't answer the door. That's their choice, but our choice is to either go with the message or not go with the message. And based on that, if we have truly been born again, there is the very first thing, the impulse that God puts within our heart 
is to share Christ and the three angels' messages with others. Now, based on that, that is why uh, typically in countries outside of America, we have seen a larger growth, a phenomenal growth among a lot of those countries. And part of the challenge that we face here in America deals along the lines with materialism and so many things that can occupy our time that we don't have enough time for God. And I have actually pastored in some churches where Wednesday night we have no more than a handful of five people, sometimes three people that show up. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that we have to be at prayer meeting, but we certainly should make time in some form or fashion weekly to give back to God apart from church worship and Sabbath school. If we take time to be involved in some kind of missionary work at the church, for example, as a Pathfinder leader, an adventurer director, praise God, you're doing something to do evangelism, to keep those children in the church. Amen? Amen. So it's not necessarily going out and meeting non-Adventists. You can meet people and minister to people in the church, but the key thing is doing something for the Lord. That's the main thing that we need to focus on as the mission thrust that God has given to us. <clears throat> and if you'll notice with me, in verse 6, he says that he saw this other angel fly in the midst of heaven. An angel, in the Greek it's angelos, it can either mean a messenger or a literal angel. And I believe that God employs both to take the three angels' messages around the world. Where human beings cannot go or where they fear to go, angels don't fear to go on God's message. Amen? And where humans are willing to go when others might think that it is not wise or, or feasible for them to go, angels go with them and protect them. But the thing that we notice here, if you'll notice, it says that they have the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth. And I think that the question regarding this aspect of missionary focus that we as Seventh-day Adventists need to ask ourselves, we may have the message in theory, but does the message have me? Does it possess me to such a point that I live the message and people can look at my life and say, there's something distinct about this man, Mr. Cook. Uh, I see him as my neighbor. Uh, things that I notice about his lifestyle, his daily activities and so forth, his way of interacting with other neighbors and in everything, everything in society. Looking at my life and being able to see that there's something different about me and leading them to inquire, what is it that makes me different? That's the other aspect of why God has given this message, this prophetic movement of the three angels' messages. It is not only to call us out from the world, because that's what the Greek word ekklesios means, those that are called out, uh, kaleo, to call out from the world and be distinct and different from, but it is also to lead us in a, one can say, a transformation of life. Christ redeems us and then he also restores us Amen. into the original image and likeness that God created us with. So that means, in essence, there is a process, and the theological term that usually is used is sanctification. So there's justification, faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, believing that I have the full forgiveness of my sins and that that is my title to heaven. And sanctification is my fitness for heaven, preparing me where God leads me to give up wrong practices and habits that are destructive to myself and others and that prepares me to be a citizen of heaven. That is the twofold message that is the core of Seventh-day Adventism. And that's where we find not only Calvary, but Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. They are combined as two halves. You can't have one without the other. And unfortunately, in the history of Adventism, some individuals like Desmond Ford, who is still living, uh, today, as well as others, have un misunderstood the two halves to Adventist theology. And once we neglect one of those two halves, we go off in branches of very distinct and different teachings that do not harmonize with Scripture. So God wants balanced Seventh-day Adventists. Amen? Amen? He wants growing, happy Christians who recognize Christ as Lord and Savior and who have experienced Christ's work in their lives to give them victory over habits. So the question then we come back to, we can have the message in theory, 
but does the message have us and possess us? So that's one of the questions I would like to leave with all of you and myself today as we, we have looked at this sermon. But the other thing that I would also like to, to emphasize dealing with the missiology, and this is where the aspect of religious freedom comes in. God will never force us to give up habits that we may cherish, that we desire to hold on to. He will never force us to give those things up. He may allow circumstances to happen in our lives to draw our attention to those things, but he will never force us to give those things up. Ultimately, it's God's love alone that can overcome any tendency to sin. And as we dwell upon that love, it is a love that if we don't resist it, it will envelop us and lead us on the pathway to heaven. Amen? In our mission work, we need to bear in mind that just as God does not force us into the kingdom of heaven, we also should not seek to obligate others that do not wish to know of Christ or the three angels' messages. Now the balance that we find there, we have an obligation, yes, to go out and share the message, but we need to be so led by the Holy Spirit that we can discern at the door or discern in the face of the person that we're talking with how receptive they are to what we're sharing with them. Now a few basic things, usually if somebody is asking us questions about our faith, that is typically a sign of an A interest. They want to know more and they're open to learning more. They're guided by the Holy Spirit. Now we need to give them just enough water so that the plant flourishes and not so much that it gets drowned if you know what I mean. And we need to do it over a period of time, not immediately, all at one time. In our mission work that we do for the Lord then, we need to be so perceptive to the responses of others led by the Holy Spirit. And it's something that it's only as we do that kind of work that we become experienced in doing that, sensitive to how others are responding. But ultimately, there will be times when we will find people that want to have nothing to do with Christ and nothing to do with Seventh-day Adventism. I still recall the time when I was uh, in the early years of my ministry. I was also doing Cole Porter work. And I had gone to an individual's door. I'd knocked on the door. And God worked out a miracle how I was able to get to the door. He had uh, a large Rottweiler and another dog that uh, weighed over 100 pounds out in the front yard. And I drove up into the driveway. And I saw the dogs. I mean, they were high enough that they actually could look in the window of my, my pickup. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just offered up a prayer and I got out of the vehicle. And they had disappeared. I didn't know where they went. I walked around to the front of the vehicle to walk to the doorway. And that's when one came around from the back side of my, my pickup. And so I stopped for a second. And then the other one came up behind me. And so I knew that there was no going back to the, the pickup because the way behind me was blocked. And the side was blocked. So the only thing to do was to go to the doorway. And so I offered up a prayer and I just kept walking. And these dogs were wagging their tails at me. Got to the door rang the doorbell the man opened the door and there was a, a glass screen door there between us and he ended up uh, the first thing that I did I introduced who I was and I told him that uh, I said I'm a Christian and I'm sharing Christ I said I was about to say Christ with people in the in the neighborhood and as soon as I got to that point he just burst out in cursing his face got completely livid and red and he actually threw his fist and and smashed into the uh, the glass pane that was there on the on the screen door and, I, you know, I was kind of taken back by that, but I paused a second and then I started to share with him again. I, I, showed, up, I, I showed him, I said, I have this booklet, Steps to Christ, that I'm, I'd like to give to you. And at that point, he just, he kind of went berserk and he simply blurted out, he said, I know how to take care of your kind. And he started to reach behind the door. Now, at that point, I knew the state that I was living in and the area that I was living in, I knew, knew what was behind the door. And he had a rifle there. Uh, and sure enough, he did. Um, but at that point, I recognized, okay, I said, Lord, I've done my part. And so at that point, I just, I, I slowly turned away from the door to step off the porch. And that's where behind me, I heard that he, op he had opened the screen door and I heard the click on the rifle. And I just offered up a prayer to God. But at that point, I had those two dogs that all of a sudden had now turned very ferocious. And they were both growling at me. 
So I have a rifle pointed at the back of my head behind me and I've got two dogs there facing me as I step off the porch. In faith, I just stepped off the porch and the Rottweiler turned his head sideways and, lun sideways and lunged right at my leg. But I still to this day remember I looked, looked down and there was like an, uh, a donut of air of space around my leg that he bit into because I saw him latch down and his jaws tightened and he started shaking his head, but he didn't touch my leg. Well, when he did that, the other dog, uh, also kind of recognizing he was, he was this, uh, the Rottweiler was attacking me, the other dog, in his panic and, and anger and so forth, being ferocious, he actually lunged at the Rottweiler and bit a hunk of his flesh right out of his shoulder. And when he did that, the Rottweiler turned on him and the two of them locked together and started rolling around in the, uh, the yard and blood going everywhere. And I just kept walking right on back to my pickup got my pickup and I went back to the church and I knelt down and with tears in my eyes I thanked God for sparing my life. Now that was something that happened many years ago but I still remember it to this day how God will protect us as we do his work. There are some people unfortunately that they will, will, they will refuse Christ, yes. But again I will repeat that does not relieve us of our obligation to do our part to at least give them the opportunity. That man, if he's now passed on by this point, but if, if after I had met him there, if he never accepted Christ, he cannot stand before God on the day of judgment and say, I never had an opportunity. Because he certainly did on that occasion. So that is why God has given us and calls us to go out and share Christ with others in taking this message around the world. So we do recognize the aspect of religious freedom that is a central part of missionary work. We also take time to recognize that Christ gives us an example of how we should relate to others when we share our faith with them. If you notice with me briefly back in the book of uh, Mark chapter 9. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 9. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, and starting in verse 51. It's verses 51 through 56. I'm not going to read it straight from the Bible, but I'll relate to you what it's talking about. Christ had steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, where he was going to be crucified. It was the last week of his life. And at that point, he sent forth two of his disciples to go out into a small uh, Samaritan village to prepare the way before him as he journeyed to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that the people in that village, when they recognized and learned that Christ was not coming to their village to, in essence, stay there with them, that he was actually going on to Jerusalem, they were indignant and they ended up refusing him passage. His disciples came back and told him this and what they told Jesus, they said, you know, they were very indignant that these people, they were offended that these people had refused Christ the Messiah. And they asked Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to consume them as Elijah did? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of because the Son of Man has not come into the world to destroy men's lives but to save them. Now, the point of this story, Christ was trying to go through this Samaritan village in the last week of his life to share with them God's love and share with them something of God's kingdom for the sake of their salvation. But they rejected him. And Christ's way of responding was not to retaliate, not to avenge himself. He let them, left them in peace. What we learn, though, is that his disciples, after spending three and a half years in public ministry with Christ, they still had not learned the spirit that motivated Christ, a spirit of love. The second question that I would like to ask all of us today, what spirit motivates me when I engage not only with other Seventh-day Adventists but with those outside of my faith? I have known some Seventh-day Adventists that if I could use the diplomatic term, they're quite pushy. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> But they get one part of the message, they focus on that, and that's the one thing that they will push and drive almost to hammering it into somebody. For some of them, it is health reform. Uh, for some of them, it's the way a woman or a man should dress or shouldn't dress. Um, and they will not only push that with other Adventists, but even with people outside of our faith. 
There are some other Adventists that they end up focusing specifically on just the sanctuary message, and they will push and hammer and drive that without recognizing the balanced perspective of all of our faith and doctrine. There's others that will end up getting caught up in specifics of aspects of the second advent of Christ and trying to disprove uh, dispensationalism and other things related to the second advent. I'm not saying that we don't need to clarify biblical truth, but we just know, don't need to have a hobby horse. There's other uh, Seventh-day Adventists that they believe that, in essence, the whole Adventist message is denouncing Roman Catholicism. And that's all they focus on. What we need to recognize is that the spirit that moved Christ's disciples was a spirit that was not from Christ, and that's why he was rebuking it. Very easily, we as Seventh-day Adventists can disconnect from Christ, even if we have the right teaching, and end up sharing, or I should say missharing, our faith in ways that do not save, but instead lead people to perdition. There are also some Adventist homes, and maybe this is getting a little bit closer to home, no pun intended, uh, but some Adventist homes where members of the family can practice the same coercive spirit, trying to, in essence, feel, feeling that their diet that they've adopted, everybody in the family should eat this exactly the same way. We've got to recognize that God has created us with a free conscience, free enough to reject him, ultimately, if we desire to. And that's what tr true love is. It doesn't demand and it doesn't coerce. So those are things that we do need to keep in mind regarding freedom of conscience and the message that God has given to us and Christ's example that he modeled for us. The third thing that comes out of this passage in Revelation 14, 6, dealing with freedom of conscience, is from an eschatological perspective. And eschatological means, it's the Greek word meaning the eschaton, the end of time, so last day events. <clears throat> Very briefly sharing on that, we as Seventh-day Adventists did not have a clear, complete eschaton or eschatology until we got to probably in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, we began to study more deeply into Bible prophecy. And at the same time, there was the development of the National Reform Association in America uh, that started back in the 19, or excuse me, the 1840s. And that is, that is when Ellen White said that that movement, the National Reform Association, was moving forward in darkness. And that's one of the specific phrases that she uses in various places in her writings. Now, I'm sharing the historical context because what that movement was doing is that they were in their public discourse, they had nothing to say about Sunday worship and making it a law. But in their private meetings, behind closed doors, they were talking about that. That if they could gain enough support from the populace in the political campaigns and be able to get individuals elected into federal offices and even the presidency, that they would be able to impose a Sunday law for the whole nation because they felt that would take the nation back to God. Kind of making America great again. <laughs> now, what we find from all of this is that back in that time period, that movement moving forward in secrecy and in darkness was something that Ellen White was exposing and talking about. And it was until the 1870s that you had, finally, that those individuals, late 18, 1870s, that ministers from that movement began to publicly debate uh, about Sunday, advocating Sunday as a national Sunday law. And Seventh-day Adventists would meet with them and they would have deba debates in public. And <clears throat> back at that time, it was something that was grabbed national attention because on the front page of newspapers, if you go back and read newspapers dating during that time period, you will find that there, that's the main front headlines was talking about the debates, the Seventh-day Adventist perspective on Saturday being the Seventh-day Sabbath and the perspective of Sunday keepers regarding Sunday and the need to make it into a national Sunday law. Now, I'm sharing with you this history to dispel a lot of the misconceptions and the false teachings that at times run rampant within Adventism. Nowadays you, you have a lot of fringe Adventist groups that what they, they are doing is they're saying they take those statements that Ellen White made where she says that movement the, about the Sunday law is moving forward in darkness and in secrecy and they will use that to build conspiracy theories. Some of those saying that the Sunday law has already been passed by Congress and it's, they're simply waiting to impose it upon the nation during a time of economic crisis. All of that is falsehood. 
Okay? The historical context that she was referring to was when the National Reform Association had not publicly made known their intent to advocate a Sunday law. But once they did that, it was out in the open and, and known by everybody. Nowadays, the groups that advocate for a Sunday law certainly don't do it in secret. They're open about their intentions. Uh, dating back to 1992 with uh, D.S. Domini, the encyclical that John Paul II wrote and promulgated, he openly says that it is the duty of Catholics to persuade and work with civil authorities to gain and garner respect for the day of Sunday. They even, uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis I, uh, in some other countries in his language of Italian and other languages where he's spoken, uh, he's been advocating that. So that is the context that we're living in today. Uh, conspiracy theories that Adv Adventists promote regarding a Sunday law that's already been passed, there is nothing, no basis whatsoever to those things. Uh, we have individuals in Congress, Seventh-day Adventists that are there monitoring what goes on in Congress. And the next time that there will be a national Sunday law, it will be something I can assure you that will gain national attention. It won't be something in secret or hidden. Uh, and it will be brought out on the floor of Congress and debated there before it is made into a law. So those are things that we as Adventists do need to be aware of, but it is for those very reasons that the idea of promoting and proclaiming and defending freedom of religion and freedom of conscience is so central to proclaiming the three angels' messages. Uh, we, as Seventh-day Adventists, need to buy as much time as it were, if we could make the statement, to proclaim this message and reach people with the three angels before the time should come where probation is closed and Christ returns to this earth. So those are the three areas, um, the missio missiological focus, the Christological focus, and the eschatological focus of the three angels' messages and religious freedom and why God has called us as a movement to proclaim not only those messages but also to proclaim and defend religious freedom and freedom of conscience and I will add not just for Seventh-day Adventists but for people of all religious persuasions because we as Seventh-day Adventists just for the record um, back in Kazakhstan, that's one of the uh, former satellite countries of Russia uh, they actually the government there destroyed a mosque in that city and we as Seventh-day Adventists were the first religious group there advocating their rights and appealing to through the Clinton administration at the time uh, trying to work out a diplomatic influence with the government in that country to actually rebuild that mosque for them uh, so that was something that we were involved in that's just one example among many uh, we have also advocated and defended the rights of freedom of conscience of Roman Catholics just for the record uh, so we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that just as we advocate that right for others, we would ask others to also respect and advocate for our right to worship according to the dictates of our conscience. May God bless us as we meditate on these things. <laughs>